The truth lies in bedtime stories. From See Through News. Series 5 A Classical Chinese Dirty Joke Told Thrice by Sternwriter. Episode 1 First Time. Is this story even worth attempting to tell in a podcast? I mean, what are my chances, simply by means of whispering in your ears, of landing a more than thousand-year-old dirty joke I learned nearly 40 years ago? The joke, by the way, is not only filthy, but in Chinese. And not just modern Chinese, but classical Chinese, their equivalent of Latin. Now, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem were it not for the fact that it's a visual joke that hinges on you being able to read Chinese script. I mean, this is ludicrous. The entire setup requires you to know how to write three relatively common Chinese characters, meaning big, great, and heaven. What chance, then, of my English words delivering the punchline for which you need to be able to visualise the more obscure Chinese character, meaning to swallow? And... Having made this quixotic attempt to translate a Tang Dynasty joke, I'm then going to tell it to you a second time, and then a third. Now, second time round, I'll be passing on a story a student flatmate friend told me about his foolhardy decision to try and remember it years later, with no props or safety net, in a social situation of extreme tension. Well, I like a challenge, so I am up for it if you are. Here goes. The setup is actually very straightforward. It's almost a Tang Dynasty version of two men going into a bar. It goes like this. Many years ago, atop two neighbouring mountain peaks were a Buddhist monastery and a Buddhist nunnery. Every day, at the crack of dawn, it fell to one of the junior monks and one of the junior nuns, to go down to the river between the two peaks to collect water for the morning ablutions. The young monk and the young nun would hoist a split bamboo pole onto their shoulders, attach two empty pails, and then make their way down narrow mountain paths to the stream in the foothills to fill them. One day, the water collection chore falls to a particularly winsome young nun. As she approaches the fork at the bottom of the mountain where the paths from the monastery and nunnery meet, a particularly lusty young monk blocks her way. I'm a sporting man, declares the lusty monk. Rather than just simply having my way with you, I'll ask you a riddle. Answer it correctly and you may continue unmolested. Get it wrong and, well... I'll have my way with you. The water being needed, the path being narrow, and clearly finding herself in a joke, the winsome young nun agrees to the lusty young monk's terms. The monk faces the nun, spreads his feet wide, his arms wider, and asks, What character am I? The nun replies, without hesitation, You're clearly da. Now, I should explain here that the monk's pose resembles the common Chinese character da, meaning big. It looks like a headless sick person with their feet planted wide and arms outstretched. Ha! cries the monk, delighted. Wrong! I'm not da! I'm tai! Okay, pay close attention here. The Chinese character tai, which means great, is identical to the character da, meaning big, remember, with one critical addition. Between the spread legs is an extra downward stroke that looks, when you think about it in this context, not to put too fine a point on it, like a massive cock. Lusty Mung starts to advance towards Winsome Nun, who says, Wait, you claim to be a sporting man. So permit me a riddle in return. If you answer correctly, you may proceed, but if not, you must let me pass unmolested. The water being needed, the request being reasonable and clearly finding himself in a joke, Lusty Monk agrees. 
Winsome Nun removes the pails from the split bamboo pole. She then balances the pole on her head before adopting the same pose the monk had, legs apart, arms stretched wider. What character am I? she asks. The monk replies straight away, you're Tian. Now, if at the top of the character for big, you add one extra horizontal stroke, it turns into the character Tian, meaning heaven. Lusty monk starts to advance, but Winsome Nun says, no, I'm not Tian. I'm Tuan. Now, if I were telling you this in Chinese and you had basic Chinese literacy, you would be cacking yourself with laughter. Trust me. You see, if at the bottom of the character for heaven, which, remember, looks like someone balancing a pole on their head with their legs apart and arms outstretched, you add three strokes, a short downward one, a right-angled one, and another short one below, you make a little box. On its own, this little box is a character for mouth. If you add the character for mouth to the bottom of the character for heaven, which is what the nun now looks like, having balanced the bamboo pole on her head, remember, this addition forms a new character, the character tun, meaning to swallow. Now this mouth, or box, between the spread legs suggests, in this context, not to put too fine a point on it, a massive vagina. OK. Maybe you wouldn't be cacking yourself, but you must admit that, as painfully explained jokes go, this one has more legs than most. At the very least, you might be able to imagine what a thrill it was for an undergraduate Chinese major to stumble across this thousand-year-old dirty joke. To put it in context for me, I just spent years being overawed by the exquisite poetry of the Tang Dynasty poets like Li Bai, Du Fu and Bai Juyi. The more layers of untranslatable genius were revealed to me, the more I felt I was barely scratching the surface of these literary demigods. With this joke, they suddenly revealed themselves to be mortals, up for a smutty snigger, even if it was wrapped in calligraphic illusion. It was like finding the Queen sparking up a crafty fag inside her horse-drawn carriage, or asking the Queen Mother to pull her finger. You might also be able to imagine I was keen to share this gem with others. As you're now painfully aware, it's never a good idea to explain a joke after you've told it, and it's a worse idea to explain it in order to tell it. In episode two, second time, I'll explain what happened when I told this joke to one of my student flatmates who was not studying Chinese, and what happened when, years later, he thought it might break the ice with a tableful of Chinese VIPs. Episode 2. Second Time. Can you remember the Tang Dynasty classical Chinese dirty joke I just told you in episode 1? Did you follow the gist? Would you have to listen to it again? Do you reckon you could tell it to someone else now and make some kind of sense? Well, you have the admittedly considerable disadvantage of having absorbed it entirely through your ears, but at least it's fresh in your memory. Maybe the two things kind of balance each other out. Anyway, you now find yourself in a similar situation to one of my flatmates at university. Let's call him Mark, as that was his name. Mark is one of the smartest people I know. When we shared a flat, I was doing my undergraduate degree in Chinese, and he was doing a PhD in artificial intelligence. Each of us enjoyed hearing the other explain what he did. What for Mark was bog-standard 101 computer science struck me as voodoo magic, and vice versa when it came to Chinese. So when I discovered this millennium-old gem of classical Chinese smut, Mark was one of the first people I tried telling it to. Equipped with two beers, pencil and paper, I made sure he got the key points showing him the characters for big, da, great, tai, Heaven, 
tien and to swallow, tuan. As I thought, Mark loved it. He may have had a big brain, but his mind was as deep in the gutter as any 1980s-era student. This joke appealed to both smart Mark and to smutty Mark. We graduated the same year. Like lusty monk and winsome nun, our lives took very different paths, geographically and career-wise. Still, as the years passed and we entered different worlds, we stayed in touch. I joined a Japanese trading company in London and started flying around the world, trading textiles, taking business trips from haute couture clients in Milan and Tokyo to factories in Karachi and Jakarta. Mark went to California to work for NASA, designing the software control system for the Mars rover project. That was about as far as my understanding of the technicalities of his job went, but as he'd tell me when our paths would cross or we'd speak on the phone, his job wasn't all bleeding-edge high-tech and staring at screens. Mark was also a very sociable, easygoing, heart-and-soul kind of guy, character traits not, shall we say, shared by everyone in the computer science community. Consequently, he was often asked to take visiting delegations on tours of his NASA facility and to entertain them in the evenings. Once, there was a delegation from the Chinese space program. Now, this was still the 1980s, so this was a very unusual visit. China had only just allowed its own citizens to buy a train ticket to another province without an internal visa, and the Chinese space program was in its infancy, only just reaching out to the rest of the world. Mark was delegated to take this delegation. A day taking a dozen Chinese space scientists around NASA had done little to deepen personal ties. None of them spoke English, so all communication went via their earnest but clearly very nervous interpreter. The delegation all wore pins of Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping on the lapels of their ill-fitting suits, which still bore labels on their cuffs. The interpreter passed on their serious questions, and they took solemn notes of his translations of Mark's answers. You'll meet few more personable people than Mark, who has an easy, familiar manner and a natural curiosity about just about everything and everyone. But even he was finding this chore very, very hard going. And the worst was yet to come. Along with a couple of colleagues, Mark was due to host the delegation for dinner. Sitting around a big table at a fancy restaurant did nothing to lighten the mood. Quite the opposite. Mark did his best to engage the po-faced Chinese delegation, but as the meal progressed, the conversation became more and more stilted and sporadic. The interpreter was doing his best. Mark's colleagues, outnumbered and awkward, were no help at all, and Mark was running out of ideas. The silences between conversational damp squibs grew longer and longer. Ordering dessert had provided a decent little canter, but no one had said a word for a couple of minutes. Everyone was staring at the table in front of them, willing their orders to arrive so they could all escape this torture. The restaurant, however, was busy, and the silence was getting exquisitely painful. That's when Mark remembered the joke I'd told him years before in our shared student flat. Before he'd had time to think it through, he said to the interpreter, Are you gentlemen familiar with a classical Chinese joke about a Buddhist monastery and a Buddhist nunnery on neighbouring mountain peaks? In episode three, third time, we'll find out how Mark's icebreaker went down. Episode 3. Third Time As the interpreter translated Mark's unusual question to his hatchet-faced colleagues, 
Mark's NASA co-workers looked at him with raised eyebrows. Mark beamed back at them, oozing confidence. But as he tried to remember the details of this elaborate joke, his own brow gradually began to furrow. There was no turning back. After an hour of, where are you from in China? And do you like Chinese food? Everyone at the table was desperate for a fresh topic, and this one seemed, well, intriguing. The interpreter asked Mark to repeat the question a couple of times, and eventually all twelve members of the Chinese delegation confirmed they were indeed unfamiliar with this particular story. When his NASA colleagues said this was a new one for them too, they were unmistakably smirking. Mark was still styling it out, though. The pause for translation had given him some breathing space to recall that moment with the beers and the paper and the pencil, and he was pretty sure he remembered the bare bones of the story. But, it now occurred to him, even in Chinese, the bare bones of the story wouldn't hack it. This joke was all about specifics. It depended not only on getting the final punchline right, but every single preceding detail as well. In translation, there was zero margin for error. With 15 pairs of eyes on him, the dozen Chinese space scientists, their interpreter and his two NASA colleagues, Mark said, Many years ago, atop two neighbouring mountain peaks were a Buddhist monastery and a Buddhist nunnery. As he began the setup, Mark felt almost as self-assured as he appeared, but he had a nagging. The series doubt. was written, narrated, he, he'd and he'd managed to reverse engineer the whole joke writer. from the final punch. Audio line, production. But he wasn't by Rupert entirely Kirkham. sure if that last Chinese. The truth lies in Keystone, on which the entire is edifice a see-through news production. Was swallow. See-through news in bird, is a non-profit social media network as in with the goal down. of speeding up carbon drawdown. As he related the setup, the focus of attention of everyone at the table. Mark more, began is it to. Just how much there was that Thank could go wrong. He was, to use an electrical engineering analogy, dealing not with room lights that worked independently, but with a series of fairy lights. If one failed, all of them would. The success of each stage depended on him remembering all the individual characters, or at least their English translations. He had a dim memory of me with the pencil and the paper along with the beers, but had, of course, long forgotten what the characters actually looked like. He could only remember the English translations. Or could he? Mark got to the first hurdle, the character for Big. Now, he was pretty sure of this one, and, sure enough, albeit after a few tense seconds of translation delay and clusters of black-haired heads conferring, his guests had clearly got it. This provoked no more than solemn nods of recognition, but then this bit wasn't the funny bit, just the setup. Still, Mark's colleagues were at least showing signs of being impressed at this response, as the interpreter wrote down the character Da in his notepad. He even stood up to demonstrate its resemblance to Lusty Monk's pose. This interlude gave Mark a bit more thinking time ahead of the first big test. He was almost certain the next character meant great, but two doubts were starting to loom. A. Would this English word work in translation as a Chinese punchline? And B. Would his guests be shocked and appalled that, however elegantly concealed, he just made a knob gag at a formal dinner? With everyone now up to speed on stage one, Mark resumed. With more confidence than he was feeling, he delivered the first test. Ha! cries the monk, delighted. Wrong! I'm not big! I'm great! Mark's voice trails off, leaving the word hanging in the air. The blank looks are back. His colleagues start to look at each other. The interpreter checks how Mark is spelling great. Mark spells it out, still smiling in as assured a manner as he can carry off. 
The interpreter nods solemnly, and relays his translation to the delegation, who once again form breakout groups to confer. Mark starts to wonder how he's going to explain this all at his next job interview, which surely couldn't be too far off now. But then a breakthrough from one of the breakout groups. After an animated plenary session, the delegation turns to him. It's the first time Mark has seen them smile. Now this may not have been the belly laugh he'd hoped for, but nor was it the shocked outrage or stony disapproval he'd feared. Given the day so far, this was progress. The interpreter deploys his notepad once more, and this time, when he stands to demonstrate the pose again, there are knowing men's looks, even a grin or two, exchanged between the Chinese delegation and his NASA colleagues. When international diplomacy fails, try a knob gag. Mark is hoping he might be able to bail out at this point, as he's starting to entertain serious doubts about the final punchline. The more he thinks about it, the less confident he is about the whole swallow business. Had it actually been pigeon or gargle? But there's no ending it here. There must be some universal grammar for jokes. For everyone at the table knew Winsome Nun must have her chance to turn the tables. Nothing for it. Mark plunges on. Lusty Monk starts to advance towards Winsome Nun, who says, "Wait! You claim to be a sporting man, so permit me a riddle in return," said Mark to his expectant audience. Crossing his fingers, he's going to get the heaven bit right. Yes, the heaven bit goes perfectly. The Chinese, now primed for the format, get it the moment the interpreter relays the word "tian" to them. They start smiling encouragingly at Mark, ready for the big one. His colleagues are now looking at Mark as if he was some kind of magician. No turning back now. Mark's almost there. Lusty Monk starts to advance, but Winsome Nun says, "No, I'm not heaven." It now feels like the whole restaurant has fallen silent. Waiters have appeared with their desserts, but are standing by, courteously waiting for Mark to deliver his punchline. Even neighbouring tables have interrupted their own conversations to hear what's happening at the table with all the Chinese, which, after an hour of murmuring and silence, is suddenly buzzing with animation. I'm not heaven. Repeats Mark, stalling for time as he fights off his panicky urge to go for pigeon or gargle. No, it must be swallow. But was it a swallow or two swallow? Better not to commit, he thinks, before delivering with a showman's grin and his outstretched palms facing the ceiling, his final choice. I'm swallow. Tumbleweed. Crickets. The waiters start serving the desserts, and the neighbouring diners pull faces at each other before resuming their conversations. But a current of tension remains around Mark's table. The interpreter relays the punchline. The breakout groups form and start brainstorming. His NASA colleagues turn back and forth from Mark, still grinning his fixed rictus, to the delegation, like spectators at a tennis match, wondering what will happen this time. Mark is starting to think about job interviews again, and just as he was about to try styling out the least graceless climb down, one of the delegation lets out a eureka yelp. He scribbles a character down on the palm of his hand as he shouts his solution to his colleagues. A split second of processing, and then, well, it's nothing short of a triumph. The entire delegation is red-faced with mirth, breathless as they repeat "tun tun" to each other. Theirs is now the liveliest table in the restaurant. As the interpreter explains it to his NASA colleagues. 
Mark struggles to resist the urge to lean over and find out what the actual character looks like. He still has no idea if it's the bird or the verb. Instead, he maintains his sepulchral oracular poise, accepting the backslaps and plaudits of his colleagues and guests. This is cross-cultural communication at its finest. Jokes just don't get any better than this. So, there you have it. A classical Chinese dirty joke told thrice, as promised. Feel free to deploy it yourself if you ever find yourself in a similar situation. Lightning might strike twice. You, too, could be a hero. But I hope you've all been paying very close attention. The series was written, narrated and produced by Sternwriter. Audio production by Rupert Kirkham. The Truth Lies in Bedtime Stories is a See Through News production. See Through News is a non-profit social media network with the goal of speeding up carbon drawdown by helping the inactive become active. For more, visit seethroughnews.org. Thank you for listening.